if there is a closed surface without any charge inside the net flux through that is going to be zero now that you've understood this and learned it the obvious next question you will have is what if i do have a surface a closed surface but a charge inside will the net flux in this case be zero and now again our intuition points that it will not be zero right because you have a fountain you have a source and it's throwing something out if it's a positive charge or collecting if it's like a sink if it's a negative charge so there must be something happening here so to do this let's begin with the simplest possible case the most symmetric one what is that a sphere let's consider a sphere of radius r and keep a point charge right at the center so the super special case right and calculate the net flux through that closed sphere because of this point charge let the point charge be positive in q we're not losing any generality by doing that so we have your sphere over here now why did we choose a sphere because we are lazy our e dot da becomes extremely easy why because the angle between e and the area vector is going to be what yeah 0 degrees right because the area vector is going to point along the radius that's how a sphere works and your electric field because of the fact that the charge is there is going to point right radial that way so we can forget the dot over there it's just the product of the magnitudes at every single point now the next good thing is that it's a sphere and there is spherical symmetry k q1 q2 by r squared makes it so that if you do calculate the electric field at any point on that sphere the answer will be equal the magnitude of it will be equal of course the direction is going to be different so what can you do all you have to do now is calculate the electric field at one of those points and multiply it with the surface area of that sphere right so problem becomes much simpler because we've chosen a very symmetric sphere in our case so what's the electric field at that point it's going to be k q by r squared right the r is the radius of the sphere so we know that our k is 1 by 4 pi epsilon not but yeah let, let's keep it that way so we've done this now then what's the area of the sphere because you have to multiply it with that and then you have a flux and that was the question so it's going to be positive or negative the flux is going to be positive right yeah. so what is the area of this let's say mugged up in your real small kids now 4 pi r squared is the surface area of the sphere we know why and all we don't know we can integrate and get the answer but that's your answer So you're going to have kq by r squared multiplied by 4 pi r squared as your flux, net flux to the surface with a charge q at the center. Now observe something. Now, have you already observed it? What is that? Some very important variable is going away. What's going away? The radius of the sphere is going away. So you have kq into 4 pi as your answer. Kq into 4 pi has nothing to do with your radius of the sphere, which means that whatever radius you've taken, you have got the same answer. Now hold on to that result because this means that I could have taken a much much larger sphere or a much much smaller sphere, and the net flux through that would have been the same. Of course, our intuition still points in that direction, which is why our water analogy and a fountain is working here. Right? If you had a fountain which is throwing water out, it doesn't matter what size of a surface I keep around it, I'm going to catch the same amount of water. Right? Yeah. Now let's observe one more interesting thing. If you bring that equation over here, you have k q into four pi, but what is k? Right? Is your one by four pi epsilon naught, and there what's going to happen is the four pi and the four pi are going to cancel now. So you get the flux to be equal to q by epsilon naught. Of course, if that's a vacuum, and if q by epsilon if it is some other medium. So you're getting the net flux through a sphere to be equal to q by epsilon naught, and it's independent of the radius. And that's beautiful, right? Now I want you to think of one thing. Right? One question that could be is, what if I move this charge away from the center of that sphere? What would happen? What would happen if I add more than one charge over here? That's another question. The third question is, what would happen if I make this not a sphere? Like, what if it's an irregular shape? So let's begin with this statement. What is our statement? This we have proved. What have we proved? That if I have a charge at the center of a sphere, then the net flux passing through that sphere, independent of the radius, is q by epsilon naught. So your statement one, which is, if I have a surface, a closed surface, and no charge inside, the net flux through it is zero, and If I have a sphere and a charge Q in the center, the net flux through it is Q by epsilon naught. Now, using this, these two, let's see if we can go to the next step. So let's go one step further and consider a random body like this with a charge somewhere over there, right? Now, I want to calculate the net flux through this surface. Now, I could calculate the electric field at every single point, calculate the Dot product of that and the area vector at that point, and then do it all over the surface. I could do that, or I could do something clever. 
right? What can we do over here? We can consider a sphere centered at that charge of a smaller radius than this large, than, than any of those. You know, however close it is, consider it's much smaller than all of that, so that it's completely inside this larger surface. So you have a sphere that's completely inside. Now you know something from your statement too, which is that the net flux through that sphere, you know. What is it? It's Q by epsilon naught. You don't have to know anything else, right? You know that for sure. Now let's take this picture and break it into two pieces. Right? So you have that sphere over there and the part of this larger surface that is not part of that sphere over here. Right? So we've kind of carved out that little sphere out of this and taken it out and you have this larger sphere, larger piece over here which is not containing the sphere. Yeah. So it kind of, kind of has a cavity in the middle. But that cavity is the one that has the charge inside. So the charge moved along and is now resting there inside that sphere. Now if you look at this piece alone, what can you say? Right? Look at this piece. Is there any charge inside that particular surface that you have over there, the closed surface? It's like a ring, right? Just like a donut, but a very weirdly shaped donut. So you don't have any charge inside, which means from statement one, what can you infer? The net flux through this must be zero, right? Yeah? Even if you had this charge somewhere inside, if this was your surface, whatever entered through the inner surfaces would leave through the outer surfaces and you get a net flux to be zero, right? Because you already proved it. So then, let's bring the pictures back together and observe now. What have we shown? From statement one, we've shown that the outer, that piece has no net flux through it. And from our statement two, we've shown that the flux through, the net flux through that sphere is Q by epsilon naught. Then what must be the flux when you put both of these together and look at that large surface together. So let's look at the interface between the sphere and that piece over there. You know that Q by epsilon naught is leaving there. And you know whatever leaves that exits because for that piece the answer is zero. So what must exit so that the middle part is zero? The answer is Q by epsilon naught. Because if Q by epsilon naught leaves the sphere and if something else leaves the outer part of this surface, then the net flux through that intermediate layer is not zero. But we know that it's zero because there is no charge inside. Therefore, we infer that the net flux through that surface, no matter what its shape is, has to be Q by epsilon naught because there is a charge Q inside. Now clearly I could take this charge and move it around because I can always find a sphere small enough that is still centered about that charge, right? Which means it doesn't matter where my charge is. And now could I add more than one charges? If I add more than one charge, then all I have to infer is that at every single point over there, the net flux cost per each of these charges will just add up because of principle of superposition. So even though I have more than one charges resting inside, I can still continue to add the flux because the flux is a scalar. And what I get in the end will be all the charges by epsilon naught, Q1 by epsilon naught plus Q2 by epsilon naught plus Q3 and so on, yeah, which is very easy to show. Then what will be my net flux? Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 by epsilon naught, right? And what do we call that? The total charge enclosed by epsilon naught. Now you could think, what if one of them is negative? Yeah, if one of them is negative, it'll get accounted for when we say total because you're gonna take a plus for the positive ones and minus for the negative ones. So we have used both our intuition and mathematics to get a very good idea of what Gauss's law is finally going to be. Because if you look at this, what we've done here is, even if you go back to the original picture of a positive charge being a fountainhead and a negative charge being a sink, then you can observe that irrespective of what shape net I build around a positive charge, all that I'm going to catch is going to depend on how much this is throwing out. If I have a larger charge, it throws out more. If I have more than one charges, it throws out more. If I have a negative charge, it sucks in a few. So it doesn't matter what shape I consider and now we're going to formalize that statement in the form of Gauss law. So what Gauss law says is that if you have a closed surface, the net flux through that, let's denote it with that symbol, equals the total charge enclosed within that closed surface divided by epsilon naught if this whole thing happens in vacuum. Now with this, the statement of Gauss law, you also have the answer to the age-old question, right? Let's bring back Coulomb's law over here and look at it. We asked the question, right? KQ1 Q2 by R squared looks more beautiful than 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 Q2 by R squared. And we told you, why did we make that constant look like that? And the answer is over here, right? So that Gauss law looks more beautiful. So we kind of sacrifice Coulomb's law of its beauty to make Gauss law more beautiful. 